Awesome. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Bhakti, and I work for Google Research, and I come from the Responsible AI team. Uh, I hope all of you are enjoying your conference, and I'm here to talk about flagging and fixing bias in machine learning. So today we're going to be talking about bias in ML, and then we're going to talk about some open source offerings from Google that you can use in your workflows to make your workflows fairer. And then we'll end with a conclusion. So let's begin with the riddle. Um, here's the riddle. A father and a son, they are in a horrible car crash uh, that kills the dad. The son is rushed to the hospital. And as he's about to operate, uh, the surgeon says, I can't operate. That boy is my son. What do you think is happening here? And how would you go about solving this riddle? Any answers? Go ahead. The surgeon is his mother. Okay. Um, the but but um, that that's that's one way to look at it. And uh, any other answers? That's that's correct. By the way, yeah. Maybe the grandpa. Grandpa. Okay, but it's it's a son, right? So not a grandson. So but uh, yeah, close. We're getting there. But, uh, but you are right. Uh, it, it could be that the doctor or the surgeon is the mother and the doctor is a she. And this was exactly what uh, the study that was conducted in Boston University showed. That when you think of a surgeon, a lot of people who identify themselves as feminists also forget or overlook the, uh, overlooked at the fact that the surgeon could be a she or the boy's gay's second father and so on. Um, so that's, that's bias. And I'm going to play a very quick video for all of you to, to think about machine learning and bias. Oops. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. OK, did anyone picture this? This? How about this? We may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the others. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. You may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, People hand code the solution to a problem, step by step. With machine learning, computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that. But just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. There's interaction bias like this recent game, where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize these. Latent bias. For example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like, and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a latent bias, skewing towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. Whether you grab images from the internet or your own photo library, are you making sure to select photos that represent everyone? Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, we've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias. From tackling offensive or clearly misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool on the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation. Because technology should work for everyone. So I hope that gave you an intro of what machine learning and, and how human bias can creep in into our ML systems as, as we deal uh, with data and, and algorithms that, that, not, that are not hand-coded. They run completely on the data we feed in. 
So this is your typical ML workflow. Most of you are aware about all these steps. It begins by defining a problem. You collect and prepare your data. You train a model, evaluate, and integrate and monitor. And obviously, you iterate through the process to ensure that you are not drifting away from concepts and your models are not becoming stale and, and you're getting the right data at each time. But essentially, uh, bias can creep in at each of these steps at, uh, in, in your typical ML workflow. For example, when you're defining a problem, you can have automation bias or historical bias or interpretive bias. Historical bias is something where the world itself is biased and you're, and you're defining in the, the problem in a wrong way. Or automation bias, you're overly relying on a machine to make judgment calls. For example, here, this was a... a Eastern Airlines Flight 401, and the pilots entirely relied on this one light, uh, gear indicator light, and they thought that uh, the machine would indicate whether they were at the right altitude. And they did not know that they were disconnected throughout, and, and you had 101 deaths because of that. So when you're defining a problem, you really need to think if, if, is it, if it, is it, uh, is it making sense to rely completely on computers or should computers be augmenting the human decision instead of making it all together? Likewise, when you're collecting and prepare data, you can have sampling bias where you're just sampling from a particular population, representation bias where you're not looking at a diverse set of users, or measurement bias where, where you're only measuring things in, in, a, in a way that, that complies to your own inherent biases. So yeah, if, if most people, like, like this meme here, most people are taking surveys, then, then you know that people like taking surveys. So that's a, that's a bias that can creep in during your prepare data phase. And when you're training bias, uh, when you're training the model, a lot of times you can have algorithmic bias or experimenters bias. And what this means is you either overfit or underfit your model to suit your own uh, to to suit your own judgment, and you often try to correlate things, and 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 this this can inherently show up as spurious correlations in in your ML workflows. And evaluate or implicit bias. Imagine you're trying to detect you're trying to design a gesture recognition system, and this is me doing a OK gesture, which is prominent in North America. But if I go and do the same thing in Brazil they will boo me out. Why? Because it, it's a very offensive gesture right there. So you need to understand how you're evaluating it and how you're evaluating over different groups as well. And finally, deployment bias. Are you even doing this, are you even deploying this model for the right audience? And, and that's where deployment bias comes in, like, like, we, like we saw uh, for, for the gesture recognition model. So in your typical ML workflow, to make things fairer, you would need to add special considerations at each and every step to ensure that you have a responsible and fairer workflow throughout. Um, so when you're defining the problem, think if automation should exist. Should you have an AI model that predicts criminality of people? Probably not. That's a bad idea to have automation for. Who is the intended user of the system? Are you designing it for the right user, or is it just a subset? And what are the risks associated if the model gets it wrong? What's going to happen? What's, what's the fallback? And what would success look like? We think about business metrics like accuracy, latency, but have you thought about fairness as a metric when, when it comes to ML models? So that's, that's on defining a problem. And uh, when you're collecting and preparing the data, think about where the data is coming from, how it's sampled, how diverse it is, and are there correlations in the data that give you indications on what the biases are? And of course, the data, is it privacy protecting? And finally, when you're training the model, think about who trained the model and how, because the experimenter it's him, himself or herself might be introducing bias into the system. And ask if you're making special fairness considerations while training your models. And finally, while evaluating, ensure your evaluation is done on a wide variety of users and uh, you're using exhaustive data sets and if fairness goals are being met when, when you're evaluating the model. 
And finally, when you integrate and monitor, ensure that your model is not stale. You're still catering to the user group you are designed to uh, serve. And, um, and, and then you also need to communicate the pitfalls of your model. So transparency becomes very important when you are finally launching. And to, to see all of this in action, we have a lot of offerings that, that can help you solve these problems. And some of them are open source, so you can use them right away into your ML workflows. And today we'll be covering some of them. Um, so, so let's start with defining a problem. So when you're defining a prob oops, when you're defining a problem, we have the people plus AI guidebook and Google's AI principles. So think about using AI for socially beneficial causes, uh, ensure that it's not uh, reinforcing bias and it's tested for safety. So these AI principles and a lot of work essentially when you're designing fairness goes into just doing this step right. And, and hence, this is a very socio-technical concept. It's not about techies just diving into the code and doing it all by themselves. It involves putting a lot of stakeholders in the same room and getting that def problem definition right. And this can be a good way to start. And this also includes things you shouldn't pursue. So if your AI application is likely to cause harms, drones in military, uh, and, and that getting wrong can have harmful con consequences creating it for weapons, uh, surveillance violating, violating internationally accepted or legal norms, you should, you should not do that. that. That's our principle, and this is one way to get started with defining your problem. There's also the people plus AI guidebook that you can use. And like I said, defining success is a major part of, of getting fairness right. And people plus AI guidebook can help you get there. So it can tell you how do you define what success looks like for the user, how should you put feedback and control, and how should you fail gracefully? Because a lot of times these models will go wrong. There's no two ways about it. What happens then? How do you incorporate a feedback loop in the process and make them better? Because this is an iterative process, remember? So People Plus AI Guidebook can help you with that. And, and, and again, the most important part is understanding what fairness looks like in, in academic research, there are 21 definitions of fairness. What works for Google Maps may not work for YouTube, and it may not work for the model you are trying to design. So you need to think about what works well, what fairness definition works well for your problem use case, and think of fairness as a metric. So I'm going to take you through some examples here. So this is one definition of fairness where you could essentially be group unaware. Imagine you are trying to design this um, ML model that decides whether you should give a loan to a uh, population. Blue and orange are the populations. And let's just say 55 is the threshold and 55 is the credit score of, of the population. And you can see that group unaware makes the bank this much profit. And let's look at another definition of fairness, which is demographic parity. You can say that we are not biased because this time we are not unaware about the identity of the group, but this time we are going to ensure that the positive rates of, of people getting the loan is comparable in both the cases. So in this case, 37%. And as you can see, that um, the loan thresholds are different for both these groups. And what that means is the profit is also going to be different. So what I'm trying to get here is the moment you change your fairness definition, it takes a different uh, turn when it comes to business metrics. And you need to ma maintain that trade-off. And you can, you can explore these playables uh, on, our, on our website as well to understand how, how this impacts uh, the models under the hood. There's another one called equality of opportunity. And again, this one is about getting the true positive rate right. So people who pay back are essentially same for both these groups. And again, uh, this has a different impact on the business metric, which is total profit for the bank as well. So as you can see, getting that user metric right is the fairness metric right is cr critical. And, and doing a right trade off with, with your business metrics is, is crucial to getting this, this part right. And finally, think about who the users are. When you're defining a problem, like for example, when you're designing this feature for Pixel that essentially does the portrait mode on, on Pixel phones, you need to think about 
who are the users, how are they segregated, uh, what's their age group, gender, race, and you should be thorough in defining this so that eventually you test it uh, exhaustively on these user groups as well. So now that you have defined the problem, this is the piece that's hard and takes most of our time at Google. The next, next piece is collecting and preparing data. So you can use this tool called Know Your Data. So this is a tool, uh, again, it's, uh, it's available to use and um, uh, you, can, you can play around with it. Um, so what this does is uh, it basically gives you a bird's eye view of what your data looks like. And it also has some inbuilt signals that can tell you if there are human faces in your data or if your uh, picture has been blurry or if it, has, um, if it has been taken in the night or in the day and so on. And the most important piece here is it tells you about correlations. So now people who are smiling are oftentimes, are, are they oftentimes the people who are wearing a hat? And this can, this can tell you that and quantify it as a metric uh, and it can tell you this. This is particularly important because you may think, oh, my model is not even having gender as an input. But oftentimes, if your model has some other input, like has makeup, you can easily tell who, what the gender is because correlations exist. So with KYD, you can look for skewed samples. So do you have more examples of women than men in your data? then that's a skewed representation. You can find that out. For example, uh, here you can see that the word, it's a, it's a text-based uh, data set, and you can see the word attractive oftentimes correlates very much with females, and beautiful, again, correlates very much with female, and so on. And you can, you can see these correlations exist. And you might think your model is group unaware, but it might be picking up on these proxies and causing bias downstream. Uh, then you can also look for um, other signals that, that exist with KYD. So you can essentially uh, uh, look for features that are not a part of your data set, but you can build upon those. Like I said, does, if, if this is a self-driving data set, are there people in this data set? And you can use KYD to figure that out. And you can also look at tainted samples and uh, proxies. So like I said, even if a sensitive attribute is not used for training an ML system, other features can often turn up as proxies. And you can essentially map that out using KYD. Uh, for example, this is another text data set. And you can see that when you correlate words like active words like riding, playing, jumping, you can see that it's skewed towards the younger population and not so much towards the elderly population. That doesn't mean that the elderly population can't do any of these, but you can clearly see the skew in the data. So this is, this is something that you can use KYD for. And finally, you can also see sample size disparity uh, uh, with KYD. If you have a majority group and a minority group, um, how many examples are coming from each group. This is something you can also look with KYD. So for, for this example, there are fewer, fewer women that fewer women who are in the data set than men and so on. And you can easily probe that using KYD. And, um, and, and yes, getting a good fair representation in your data is very important. I mean, it's the hard part, but you can get a lot of bang for the buck if you get this process right. Now imagine that you have done your best to collect and prepare data, but there's only so much you can do. And now whatever considerations you have to make are at the training step, there's not much you can do. Then there are some fairness considerations you can do at the training step to make your model fairer. So essentially you can remediate your model if you have identified bias. So essentially if you have a data set and it's skewed, you can collect more data, but if you don't have the budget, you can generate synthetic data or you can upsample the data in certain ways so that the distribution is same. So these are data pre-processing techniques. You could also do training time modeling techniques to remediate bias. So essentially, you can change the model's objectives in itself. You can add constraints to the model while training it. Uh, or you could do some post-training methods to remediate for bias. And this is, again, at the model level. So you tune the model's outputs to in a certain way so that the interpretation of the outputs can improve the performance across the fairness metrics you, that you have set. 
So this is one other technique, and this is also open source. This is from a model remediation toolkit. This is MINDIF. Imagine that you are trying to uh, train a model, and you want the performance of these two distributions to be the same. You don't have the data resources, but you are trying to do something at the model level. So you can use this MINDIF law that you can add to your model. And then you can see that the majority and the minority group have equalized distributions uh, in, in this case. This is particularly helpful if you are, say, training a toxicity classifier, and it's, it's, it's trying to uh, uh, call a certain uh, group more toxic than the other. So you can use this MINDIF loss in your training, and, and you can uh, observe that uh, it improves the performance there. There's also the TensorFlow constraint optimization. So now, a lot of times, these fairness goals that we talked about, the 21 fairness definitions, they can be written as constraints. Uh, so you can say that the true positive rate of majority is e needs to be equal to the true positive rate of the minority. And that's demographic parity, essentially. And likewise, for equality of opportunity. Now, you can take all these constraints uh, using our using the TensorFlow Constraint Optimization Toolkit and add them to your training objective. And this is, again, open source. And, and you can see that um, this helps improve uh, the, the model's performance over, met, uh, over the various groups. On your right, you can see that you're trying to train a classifier, which essentially predicts whether a person is smiling or not. And without constraints, you can see that it oftentimes thinks that uh, old people are not smiling or their false positive rates are higher. And then with the constraints added, you can see that the gap reduces and the overall false positive rate for both the groups also reduces. So you can use this toolkit or you could use counterfactual logic pairing. So again, you're training this toxicity classifier and you put these sentences in a toxicity classifier and you can see that all these sentences None of them appear to be toxic, but the model is learning these correlations, right? So it's seen as toxic, and the toxicity scores are very different for, for all of these groups. What do you do then? Uh, so then, essentially, you can use this counterfactual logic pairing loss, which is, again, open sourced. You can use this, and you penalize the model for predicting any of these uh, sentences differently. And when you train it over and over, you will see that um, Essentially, it, it closes, it not only brings the toxicity score of the model down for, for all these terms, but also closes the gap between the various uh, groups. So you've trained your model. You have tried your best to prepare the data in a diverse uh, way. Now it's time to evaluate the model. And again, this should be in an iterative loop, like I said. There are several tools to iterate or flag uh, bias in, in ML models. So one is fairness indicators. Again, this is open source. So essentially, you can look at sliced metrics across the various groups, and you can see how you're performing um, over, over the female group, or the male group, or the LGBTQ group, and so on. And you can slice it across the user groups, whatever user groups you have uh, that you thought about in defining the problem stage, and, and see how you're performing. And oftentimes, when you deal with fairness, your data is going to be very sparse. You're not going to have enough information about each of these groups. So then fairness indicators toolkits comes with confidence intervals. So it tells you how confident it is about each of these metrics. So you can even work with sparse data uh, when, it, when it comes to these evaluations. You can also use the what if tool. Again, this is open source. Um, so essentially, you have a model, you have its predictions. What if I just change the, the age group? And, and is that causing my model to flip its decision? Uh, you, can, you can find out all these what if scenarios using the what if tool and understand if there's bias, if it's over indexing on age to give a particular response, and, and, um, and if it's, it's over indexing on some other sensitive attribute to predict a decision. And uh, there's also the language interpretability tool. So if you're working with languages, and, and here you're looking at a sentiment analysis model, just changing the word waiter to waitress is causing the model to behave differently. Sentiment is the same. But it's, it's just that you're changing the gender, so you can see how much a term is causing the model to flip its decision or, or to weigh in, in, in one way or the other. 
can use a language interpretability tool which is also open source and once you're evaluate once you're done evaluation you can essentially use model cards to uh, govern the uh, to, to basically communicate what your model is doing uh, to to the broader audience not just to model developers of course as coders we we know what the model does and we can read into code but for the lawmakers for the model users it might be hard and and transparency and communicating what the model is good at and what the model is bad at is is just as important as building the model itself so we have the model card toolkit so what this does is it basically tells you what is the model good at what are the intended use cases for example face detection what should you be using this for what what is it good at what data sets has it been trained on and uh, what are its limitations and ethics and considerations and you can do this for your model as well and this again is an open source tool uh, that you can use so with that uh, there are several offerings that we have uh, to to make your workflows fairer and a lot of these offerings are open source so be sure to use them uh, and uh, with that thanks a lot and did you see your message about running on your battery yeah <laughs> oh you saw it too oh gosh okay. <laughs> yeah i think i just made it in time but any questions <laughs> yeah go ahead I'm curious how many of you have considered fairness in your AI or ML workflows maybe a show of hands Oh wow that's great and were any of these findings or toolkits new to you if yes then a show of hands perhaps okay great <laughs> so this talk was helpful <laughs> Are you are you saying do we have tools that can automatically yeah. annotate? Yeah, or I didn't know if there was anything that, that assesses geography. What kind of pictures? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm thinking actually what I'm thinking of is like a lot of the automotive uh, tool sets you know that we have that are like uh, you know like the Oh right yeah i think the question is around do we have tools on identifying where data set or how well represented a data set is in terms of geographical locations we don't have locate we, we we don't have any annotators that that can do this out of the box but if you have those location annotations as to where the image was taken then you can obviously explore them using know your data and see how well represented that is we also had this competition called open not a competition but a crowdsource challenge called the open images challenge and we saw that a lot of times when you when you source data sets often times it's it's from north america or or it's it's not as diverse as it should be so we did this challenge and we got uh, people to crowdsource images including a lot of googlers and and we created this this data set um so you had diverse representations of what a wedding meant it could mean a christian wedding or a hindu wedding and so on so it was a more deliberate process but yes we did go through some 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 data auditing to come to that point and realize that yeah there there was a skew or there was misrepresentation no problem any other questions Uh well thank you very much for your time and I hope uh, you use some of these uh, in your workflows thanks